This week we spoke to Dr. Gabriel Felix. Gabriel is a psychiatry resident at Harvard with a particular passion for black mental health and justice. Our conversation looked at why he wanted to get into psychiatry and the impact of coronavirus on black mental health in the United States. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a rating and a review on iTunes. Hi, Gabriel. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Thanks. Um, so to start off, with, we always ask what your kind of personal and professional uh, relationship with mental health looks like. Oh, OK. So uh, professionally, um, I'm currently a psychiatry resident at Cambridge Hospital, one of Harvard Medical School's teaching hospitals. Uh, so there I am completing my four year residency to become a board certified psychiatrist. Um, in terms of my personal relationship with mental health, um, I know many of my family members uh, actually suffer from some form of mental illness. Um, unfortunately, it isn't uh, highly recognized, but um, it's actually one of the things that uh, made me interested in, going, interested in going into the field of mental health. Sure. And you talked a little bit about your kind of motivation for wanting to go into the mental health field. Would you be able to kind of elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, for me, uh, my, my cultural background is that I'm Haitian American. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm West Indian. And so unfortunately, what you largely see in that community is that mental health isn't something that is um, something that's destigmatized yet. Um, unfortunately, many times it's viewed as a sort of punishment or some form of uh, unfaithfulness in the uh, community. Uh, it's not something that's really valued in terms of seeking mental health, uh, you know, maintaining your wellness outside of many religious structures that, you know, exist there. When we spoke to, to someone else last week, they were saying that in the UK, there's, uh, there's a lack of black therapists, psychologists and psychiatrists and that kind of impacts the quality of care that, that they got and that for them, they wanted to see someone who had a similar ethnicity or race and life experience to them. Is that a similar kind of issue in America with, with people going into medical school and then going on to psychology and psychiatry? Yes, and I actually forget the exact numbers, but it's a very small amount of uh, those who identify as Black core therapists, uh, particularly in the field of medicine when we talk about psychiatry. Um, only 5% of the physician workforce, about 5 to 6% identify as Black or African American. And, you know, even among that percentage, that's a, you know, there's an even smaller percentage that are psychiatrists. So there isn't a very large amount of Black mental health professionals within the community. Um, and that's a really big issue because many times, you know, particularly now where mental health is, you know, slowly becoming less stigmatized, people are searching for Black therapists and unfortunately in certain areas they're not able to receive that help. Uh, and for some people who have done any type of mental, um, sought any type of mental health, uh, you know, there have been studies that show that they have experienced microaggressions or, you know, some forms of subtle racism from their therapists. So there's this unfortunate, uh, you know, trend going on where there's not enough therapists and for the therapists that are out there, not many of them are culturally uh, competent. Yeah, so I think, I said this quite a lot of times before, but I think I was incredibly lucky in that the first psychologist I saw, I kind of had a, a brilliant relationship with straight away. Um, but I realise that's not the case for quite a lot of people. So what, what would be the particular advantage to having someone of your own race or ethnicity as your therapist? Uh, well, I think the first is, you know, I think uh, a cultural awareness, um, particularly in the Black community, um, you know, certain languages, certain um, 
you know, colloquialisms may be better understood. Uh, not necessarily to say that there's one black experience. Uh, I think that's sometimes a misconception that many people have, but just having someone who looks like you um, and can understand maybe even some of the form of microaggressions or uh, some of the daily struggles of being a black person in this country can be understood by that person. Uh, and so that kind of helps with the therapeutic alliance in terms of being able to recognize and not, you know, as the patient, or the client having to bring up certain forms that may be psychologically distressing. So even that subtly right there is something that can help. Uh, you know, we talk about different forms of microaggressions, uh, black women with, you know, you know, issues surrounding their hair in their workforce, or black men, you know, this kind of uh, schema that many people have in terms of what that looks like. I think that if you have someone who looks like you, they can understand it and they can address it uh, to give culturally uh, competent care. Um, so, you know, I really, you know, do wish there were more black therapists, you know, and I'm really hoping that we do see a trend in those, you know, hoping to enter that profession. Yeah, and, and the guest that we had on last was also saying about how, um, she was talking about how um, in the UK, a lot of the time, mental illnesses and mental ill health and even kind of lower level stuff gets... Um, falls into kind of racial stereotypes and means that that people don't get either the right diagnosis or the right care is that something you can see in your work as well uh, I, i'm not seeing it as much in my work but there is a historical context to that um you know even during the civil rights civil rights movement you know there were uh you know forms of racism even embedded in the field of mental health. Uh, during that time, you know, many people, particularly black men, uh, were given the diagnosis of schizophrenia um, just for the sake of, you know, uh, this misconception or, you know, this propaganda that they were more violent, they were participating, participating in protests. So there is a racial underto undertone when we, when we speak about that. So there, you know, even for kids, you know, black children are more likely to uh, you know, get uh, certain diagnoses that have to do with oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, compared to, uh, you know, white uh, patients around their age. Um, so that is one of the instances where we do see a disparity in terms of quality mental health care. What does the, the mental health care landscape look like across America? Is it, I don't know how much you know about it in the UK, but is it, is it a similar thing to the UK with very long waiting times and um, and often um, inappropriate, not inappropriate, but um, the wrong kind of care given to people, or is it a bit different? I think it might be slightly different. Um, in terms of the long wait times, I think that depending on someone's preference for mental health care, that can be a big barrier. I don't think that there are enough resources dedicated in America, particularly. Uh, when we talk about uh, black and brown communities, um, many times uh, there's always um, an issue with insurance um, in terms of getting authorization for certain treatment. Uh, and, you know, there, you know, these can all compound to a long waiting time, particularly if someone has a preference for a therapist of color. Um, so for us, uh, it's there's not necessarily um, an issue where I would say that it has to do with poor care. I think it more has to do with many systemic barriers that prevent people from actually accessing the care. So is it, is, I guess there's a reluctance to, uh, to kind of approach someone to get care if you don't have the appropriate insurance or you don't have it at all, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, now because, you know, we're, America is in a very strange place with the Affordable Care Act, uh, mental health is covered for, for many other people, uh, for many people in the country. So, uh, you know, there is movement towards, uh, you know, increasing access to care, and it is state dependent, depending on how much funding is put uh, into mental health resources. So uh, there's actually kind of a spectrum of you know, access and quality of care in the United States. So does that vary state by state? Yes, I would say so. So if, so say I, I take a prescription every day for, uh, for depression, I take uh, sertraline, um, would access to that in America be, I think I pay about eight pounds uh, per prescription, so that's a month's worth. Would that be significantly more costly in America, or is that covered under the the, the Care Act that you were talking about just then? 
So that I'm not exactly sure. So sertraline, um, also known as Zoloft, uh, you know, it comes in the, its brand form and its generic form. And, you know, I've heard of issues where, um, you know, certain insurance companies will not pay or not cover uh, the brand name form, but will cover the, gener the generic form. Uh, the thing about navigating insurance is that sometimes that information isn't given to certain patients, and, I, and I've heard of that issue occurring. Um, so sometimes you can be expected to pay, you know, probably an exorbitant price for, you know, the same type of medication, even though there may be, you know, just a slight molecular difference. Uh, so that can be an impediment towards people actually getting the care that they need. Um, so it's not necessarily covered uniformly, uh, just because not everyone um, has the same type of insurance, but you know, because there is that difference, some people may have issues and some people just may not have access to the knowledge or the, you know, the resources to be able to figure that out. Yeah, that's interesting. So to kind of move on to, to more contemporary issues that are going on today, um, in the UK, you might have seen that we've had reports and a lot of evidence that uh, coronavirus has kind of had a disproportionate impact on uh, black communities, but also uh, just other ethnic minority communities in the UK. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I think that's kind of the one thing is the, the physical impact, I suppose. But in your work, do you think you'll see a, a more long term? Well, first of all, is that is that the same in America? And do you think you'll see uh, a kind of more long term trend of, of of psychological distress from that or, or what kind of issues can you see arising from that? So yes, it's definitely the case uh, in the United States, unfortunately. Um, black and brown communities are disproportionately affected by COVID, um, particularly during its peak time uh, in the United States. Uh, there were hospitals where, you know, black and brown uh, individuals took up a greater percentage of hospital beds compared to other counterparts. Uh, in terms of deaths, you were seeing a higher percentage uh, for the Black, uh, Latinx, and Brown communities. Um, and it, it was just uh, very unfortunate. And I do believe that we will see, and we are seeing now, um, the psychological impacts of that. Uh, for many people, you know, the, these disparities were seen because of um, I, what I would say racism in the country, where you see uh, this higher percentage of comorbidities uh, due to, you know, diabetes, hypertension, and that's due to poor access to care, uh, food deserts in communities. Um, and so uh, in terms of the psychological assault, you know, you have people who um, you know, are, you know, particularly in America, seeing uh, lots of trauma. We have an issue of police brutality and violence in this mm -hmm. country, uh, in addition to worrying about, you know, this global pandemic. So you have all these psychological, um, you know, assaults going on. Um, and, you know, not much is being done. I mean, I think we're seeing a movement now, uh, which has been long overdue. But for many people, this has been going on for so long. And, you know, with these things going on, uh, I, I think we are seeing a, a rise in, you know, uh, people undergoing mental health crises. Yeah, that's something that I also wanted to ask about is how, how are you personally mentally coping with both I suppose the increased stress around a global pandemic, but also the the kind of the the Black Lives Matter movement and and how you're coping with the protests and and everything that's going on there. How is it impacting you personally? Oh well, for me personally, I mean, at many at sometimes it can be a lot, uh, and I think that's because sometimes we all have this idea that we can do everything. Um, by ourselves or we can take on all of these things going on, these uh, protests, you know, being active in the hospital. Uh, and so for me, the way that I've been managing with it is, you know, I'm a spiritual person. So uh, me going back to my faith, uh, meditation, things like that have been particularly helpful for me. Uh, I'm in a privileged position where I can also, um, you know, partake in wellness activities in terms of being able to exercise outside of my house. Um, you know, connect with my family over the phone uh, and really take a time, take the time to disconnect at times. Uh, you know, I think at this time people are being inundated with so much information regarding the news, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and they're seeing all these images of protests, violence, people dying, um, you know, 
all these political issues going on. So for me, uh, it's really been important to take time to myself to disconnect at times, uh, to connect with family members and to really try to replenish my spirit in terms of being able to function, uh, particularly during this time. Yeah, that's interesting. And one thing that I've, I've seen you write about is, um, is wearing a mask and how, you know, you have to do that at work. But I think where you are, was it mandated that, that you had to wear it outside as well? Right. And so I, I wrote that article, um, you know, after, you know, getting a text message from my um, town saying that face coverings would be mandatory in public. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, for me as a physician, you know, I think sometimes people see kind of have this dualistic perspective of me, you know, you would think that many of the things that you see on television about black men being stopped by police, uh, you know, police brutality, you know, issues with law enforcement don't affect certain people. But what I tell people is that, you know, I've only recently become a physician, but I've been a black man all of my life. Uh, so many of these things that other people don't necessarily think about, especially when it comes to, you know, walking in my neighborhood with a mask, especially if it's during the evening time, uh, you know, there are certain precautions that, you know, I think of and certain things that I have to take into account that, you know, many of my non-Black colleagues didn't even think of until they saw my piece. Um, and so that's just one example of, you know, that's something that I had considered a psychological assault of having to, you know, worry about that and plan my day according to, you know, a new mandate uh, that I don't think was taking into consideration um, how racism plays in society still. Yeah, and what, what was the kind of reaction from your friends and colleagues to that piece? So, so very, I will say largely supportive, but, you know, it was surprising to me that there was a bit of surprise. Uh, for a lot of people, you know, they kind of seemed like, oh, I didn't know this was going on. I didn't know that you experienced this. Uh, which was interesting because, again, what I wrote about wasn't anything new. There was just a new context in terms of a mask. Uh, but, you know, you know, this kind of trepidation that you have is, is nothing new, nothing novel. Uh, and it was interesting. And I think more people are becoming aware of that, and, you know, some of their biases and some of the privilege that they have, that they don't have to consider this. Was it because, do you think they were unaware that it was, that these things were happening to you because you have quite a high profile career and they, and they assume that, you know, someone who's a doctor and, 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 and very successful, that, that it wouldn't happen to them. I think there was, there was a hint of that. Um, I also think that some people just didn't think about it at all. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think it's a, a, there was a, you know, some people who thought it was like, well, you're a doctor. Why would you be concerned about this? Um, and, you know, I, I do have the privilege where, you know, my name, badge says physician, but you know, there's also the instance where I may not be wearing it or if I'm not wearing my scrubs, um, you know, I'm just a regular person when I leave the hospital. And so I think that was something, you know, that people came to realize after reading it. And my goal in writing it was kind of to try and put people in my shoes uh, and just see, you know, this kind of uh, dualistic uh, life that I, I essentially live just because of the color of my skin and, you know, the history of the United States. What kind of, I suppose, looking at it from a wider perspective, what kind of impact does, uh, maybe I'm not particularly talking, well, maybe I am, what kind of impact does both kind of avert racism, but also kind of the, the microaggressions and the unconscious biases that you were talking about a bit earlier, what kind of impact does that have on, on people's mental health? So the way that I like to frame it is, uh, you know, there's a very interesting analogy that people say. It's kind of like the 1,000 cuts. Uh, I like to say 1,000 mosquito bites. Um, and I think there's actually a very interesting um, visual on YouTube if you Google it. So essentially, you know, it's uh, imagine getting a mosquito bite, uh, you know, during the summer. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. But, you know, let's say that you get like a few in a day. So it may be itchy, it may bother you, but you can typically go on, you know, with your regular day. So, you know, I imagine those as microaggressions and bits of racism. So, you know, mosquito bites don't necessarily heal overnight. Some of them do and some of them don't. So you may, you know, see some of them, but you can go on with your day. So imagine that happening day after day after day after day. And so let's say like 15 days later, you know, you're 
500 mosquito bites in. Um, and so, you know, you can typically cover, you know, mosquito bites with clothing, you know, they're not necessarily visible, typically where people get bitten. But after a certain point, when you can get to like, let's go a month in if, and I'm taking this in the context of, you know, education or a workplace, you have like a thousand mosquito bites and, you know, it just takes one more where you kind of, you know, decompensate and you, you, you get upset, it can turn into some type of, you know, um, kind of breakdown. Um, so I tell people to just imagine like, you know, commenting on, you know, something that may have racial undertones, uh, you know, in terms of comparing, uh, you know, two people who don't necessarily look alike, uh, but you're saying that, you know, commenting on someone's hair, uh, making, you know, any type of comment that has a racial undertone or treating someone differently based off of their skin and that perception uh, really does take a toll and it builds up. And unfortunately, many people, particularly for black people, uh, they still have to navigate whatever setting they're in uh, with all these, one, as I say, 1,000 mosquito bites. Uh, so that's typically how I like to frame microaggressions. It's not necessarily something that happens immediately, but this is the buildup uh, you know, that typically happens over people's entire lifetime. Uh, and, you know, for some people, they can manage well, but for other people, you know, it adds a bit of anxiety, um, it leads to some depression, uh, you know, that can manifest in forms of anger, frustration. Uh, that's typically how I like to frame it. Yeah, so that's, that's really interesting. And I'll, I'll try and post the, um, the YouTube video that you, that you mentioned alongside the show notes. So does, you said that's kind of more the, the, the microaggressions thing. Does, does the more kind of overt racism, does that have, does that play into um, issues like PTSD and things like that? I, I would definitely think so. Um, and so when we talk about PTSD, you know, we're typically four symptoms that you typically see over, you know, someone's, um, you know, time of experiencing it. So the kind of a hypervigilance, um, you know, in, uh, kind of a remembering of the past and some type of distress. Uh, and so I think that if someone experiences what I call explicit or overt racism, that can be seen in the form of a comment, um, it can be seen in policies, it can be seen, uh, you know, in many different forms. I think that many times, you know, for someone who experiences that, they get to a point where they have to be hypervigilant and try to avoid it, or they are very sensitive to certain words uh, you know, it's not it's not necessarily a PTSD per se, but there there is trauma associated with it, and I think that's one of the crux. I mean, that's a major crux of um, you know post traumatic stress disorder that you've experienced some type of trauma, and because racism can take you know varying degrees uh, depending on how severe it might be, it may manifest uh, psychologically or even physically in a number of ways. We we don't be asked about how um, how the guest. I kind of touched a little bit on it just now, but how do how do you personally, in in more normal times, I suppose, look after your mental health? But what would you also advise um, people who are struggling a little bit with their mental health at the moment because of what's going on in the world? How would you advise? What kind of things would you advise them to be doing? Uh, so my advice would be for number one, be mindful of the information that you digest. Again, I, I referred to it uh, earlier, but it is okay to unplug from the media, from the news sometimes, and really focus on yourself. Uh, I think that, again, we are in times where technology allows us to digest a lot of information at a very rapid rate, and many times you don't even get to process some of that information. And a lot of the times, the things that we digest are traumatic. Um, if you heard in the United States, uh, videos of George Floyd, uh, information of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, you know, that was uh, spread globally just to try and get some movement. But again, that was traumatizing for certain people to see. Um, and so I tell people it's very important to unplug and make sure, you know, try to take up a practice of being mindful. Uh, there are many applications that are free and available that are uh, that you can do and partake in. Uh, the second thing that I would say to people is to um, give your permission to feel what you're feeling. Uh, and, you know, many times people aren't really, really willing to acknowledge that they're, you know, they're stressed out. They are a bit anxious about the things that are going on. And I think giving your permission 
uh, to experience that fully uh, is something that can be very empowering and powerful. Uh, I'm hoping, you know, we were talking about the lack of mental health resources that if that option is available, uh, that many people would pursue that. I think, uh, you know, seeking a therapist or even finding someone that you trust and can speak to freely uh, will really, you know, help with someone's mental health well-being. Um, and also, I think that it's important to really know that you don't have to be, you know, quote unquote, strong right now. I was just thinking about that this morning. Um, and I think that many people think that you just have to carry on. And it kind of relates to what I was saying before. But I think that acknowledging that, you know, we are in very difficult times and uh, that, you know, sometimes you need a break is very important. So really just taking time to, you know, focus on your mental health, I think, during this time, uh, either in terms of deplugging, uh, doing something that, you know, brings you joy and happiness is really important. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that completely. And it seems to be, the things you're saying seem to relate quite a bit to, to mindfulness, that notion of um, just letting things be as they are for that moment. And not always having to be striving for things um, right so how how do you personally look after your mental health is it you, you were talking a bit about exercise earlier is that something that's that's key to your kind of routine i suppose yes yeah, so you know for me before it, it was kickboxing unfortunately the gyms have closed down in terms of uh, you know covid19 uh, but I've, you know, retaken, uh, you know, the practice of yoga. I found that to be very, uh, you know, um, therapeutic for me, per se. I also, you know, in addition to my prayers, you know, meditation is something that has been very transformative for me in terms of a mindfulness practice. Uh, I'm not consistent with it every, every day, but, you know, as much as I can, I try to take some time to just sit in silence and, you know, allow my thoughts to come and go and not get attached to them uh so for me the exercise the meditation and you know just keeping in contact with friends and family as much as i can through various platforms has been really uh stabilizing for me is, is the mindfulness kind of stuff a formal practice that you do or just like using an app or something or or a video or is it more kind of something you do uh in your own head i suppose <laughs> Also uh, depends on the context. Uh, a lot of times I actually prefer to do a guided meditation. So uh, using, um, you know, this is not an endorsement, but apps like Headspace, uh, Insight Timer, uh, even YouTube has a couple of free videos that I've found to be very good. Um, I think, you know, in this time, there are many options uh, for when I'm not trying to, you know, use my cell phone or my tablet, you know, I, I have developed a practice for myself where I uh, sit down and count my breath and try to do a visual uh well a mental scan of my body just to make sure that i'm like feeling all of my body and you know addressing any tension that i might have so there are different ways to do it um and i usually encourage people to you know try different forms and see what works for them and gabriel just to to kind of wrap things up where can we find more about the work you do your writing all of that kind of stuff uh, well, um, my writing is all over the place, uh, and so is my work. Um, but for any other information or to contact me, um, you can go to drgabrielfelix.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at the Dr. Felix. Brilliant. Gabriel, that's been really interesting and, and, and insightful. Thank you. So thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. Just a quick note to say, although the things Gabriel and I talked about we may find helpful, I'm not a trained medical professional. If you're struggling with your mental health, please contact a GP or an organisation like Samaritans on 116 123.